The Power of One. A Canadian businessman has brought 61 families, more than 200 people, from war-ravaged Syria to Ontario. Jamesil is helping them start over. He has spent more than $1 million of his own money to resettle them in and around the town of Guelph, which is about 100 kilometers from Toronto. He sees that they learn English, find work, and so much more. Jim joins me now from Phoenix, Arizona. Jim, it is so great to have you with us. Well, thanks for having me. You have seen a lot of global conflicts play out in your lifetime. So what was it about the situation in Syria that made you feel compelled to take action? Well, I actually believe Syria is probably the greatest humanitarian crisis in my lifetime in the world, or at least I hope it is. And I was just trying to do my small part. And there's nothing special about Syria. It just happened to be uh, a place where there's a humanitarian crisis happening. And I thought I could contribute something. You, you had the idea of contributing something, of, of trying to help. It's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to take the steps to make it a reality. Talk to me about the level of difficulty involved um, in terms of the process to bring all of these families out of Syria. So I, I approached it like a business. So I have a director of uh, housing, a director of food, a director of jobs, a director of mentorship. Every family is assigned a Arabic-speaking mentor family and English-speaking mentor family. The, fam the mentors have checklists of, you know, set up a bank account, get a health card, get a doctor, go to the library, get a library card, get a bus pass, ride the bus, wow. and we do scorecarding. So it, it, we approached it like a business. And although everyone gives me the credit for it, I have 800 volunteers. So it's more like running a business, like, like what I do with the MB Appliances. I don't actually do anything. I have people that do everything. <laughs> And not quite true, but I take your general point that it is a team effort. Um, I know that you you just had three three more families arrive um, in April, I think April 16th. Talk to me about what that first experience of meeting them is like. What goes through your mind? How do they how do they respond when they finally land there in Canada? Well, of course, it's a grueling experience to get here. So that particular family had been waiting for over a year to get through all of the government red tape and the background checks and the health checks. And then they had uh, they were traveling for more than 24 hours straight by the time you took their layover. So they arrived extremely tired. Um, we were at, waiting at the airport for over four hours before they got processed uh, by the Customs and Immigration so that we could uh, take them back to Guelph. And we had uh, four cars because it was... Uh, you know, you've got seven people with uh, luggage, and we arranged to have some of the volunteers set up their home, their temporary home, and arrange a dinner for them. So when they got there, they had something to eat uh, with lots of leftovers, so their fridge was full. And then uh, we let them get their sleep that night. Oh, it's just so amazing. How do you decide, though, Jim, who gets to leave Syria and start that new life? Oh, that, that is the worst part, because I've been approached by more than 1,000, probably close to 10,000 people that want to be brought to Canada. And people think I can major, wave a magic wand and do it, and it's not that simple. So generally speaking, I've supported families that I thought had a chance of being self-supporting, and that means working and supporting themselves. Um, many of them had some family in Canada, so I'm supporting people, bringing in people who had uh, some connection to Canada already, and I think that gives us a higher chance of um, them doing well in Canada. Yeah. I mean, I know that, you know, here in the United States, there have been some communities in the past uh, that expressed some resistance, opposition to having Syrian refugees relocated to those areas. I mean, talk to me about Guelph, you know, a city of about 120,000 people. How welcome are they made to feel these people have come from such a long way away and have been through so much. Well, Guelph is extremely multicultural to start with. It's a university uh, town, and if you walk through the, the town, it's already very multicultural. So Guelph has been very, very supporting. Um, I will say, to answer that comment, that every wave of immigrants and refugees tend not to be welcome. So Canada and the United States did not welcome the Italians. We didn't welcome the Irish. We didn't want the Catholics. We didn't want the Jews, we didn't want, and then within a, a decade or two, that wave of refugees is accepted. 
Um, in Guelph, the largest company is uh, was started by a Hungarian refugee, um, and it has over 10,000 employees. And he was a refugee, and when he first arrived, you know, he lived in the train station for a couple of weeks while he got his. And interestingly enough, he actually worked at my company, Danby oh, Appliances. No way. Yeah, so it's a small, a small world in that regard. No, it certainly is. I mean, you know, Jim, people are going to watch this conversation and they're they're going to be saying to themselves, "Wow, that's amazing! He did that. He he took the idea, he made it a reality." But I could never do that. I could never make a difference like that. What do you say to those people who sit on the edge of wanting to get well, involved? Well, I think that you contribute what you can according to your means, according to your time. And that could be everything from simply being accepting and open through to donating money, through to being on a volunteer team, through to helping. Um, and that is very helpful if people simply are open and helping. And I, I believe a few decades from now, the refugees will be, you'll, you'll see the success that they bring. And everyone in North America, except for the indigenous people, are you know, they're immigrants, um, and it's only been very recently in our history that any, you know, people like me have been here. Yeah, no doubt. Um, last question to you. Um, you talk about the future and, you know, your expectation that these families will do well and all these immigrants being, you know, being accepted in, in Syria, from Syria. Um, what about you? I mean, talk to me about you and, and the impact this has had on you and how it has changed you for the future. So I was always very philanthropic, and Danby Appliance's tagline is do the right thing. And this one just happened to get more press than some of the other initiatives that we have. Uh, however, I did discover the secret of happiness through this um, venture. And I believe the secret to happiness is being grateful for what you have, not ungrateful for what you've lost or ungrateful for what other people have. And I see the people who come and have lost everything, and the ones that are happy are the ones that are grateful. And the ones who are bitter are the ones who are ungrateful for what they've lost or ungrateful for what other people have. And I think that applies to all of us. I think those are very, very wise words, words to, to end this conversation on that we should all contemplate. Jim Estel, thank you for all that you do in the world. And, and thank you for making time to speak to us. Thanks, Aisha.